Hello, my name is Matthew Reese, and I will be asking the question, who killed the golden age? I first started getting into comics, and I mean really getting into comics, in the early 1990s. I came in when Paul Reed was the Green Hornet, and Tim Drake had just become Robin. I got bit by the bug, and I got bit hard. And I poured myself into comic book history. It was then I heard a story, the story of the ages of comics. That comics had began, begun with a great golden age in the late 30s and 40s, being a high watermark when comics had first gained tremendous popularity and a height of art. But all things must come to an end. I learned that there was a lull in comics, and that at first the Martian Manhunter and then Flash and Green Lantern had rejuvenated comics and prepared the way for the Marvel Age, this great silver age that regained the comics to their height of grandeur. But what was it that killed the Golden Age? What was it that brought an end to these halcyon days? That is a question that I intend to answer. But first, we have to define our terms. What is the Golden Age? And when did it start? Comic books as we know them today were first developed in 1935. It's pretty widely known or, or, or agreed upon. The Golden Age, though, is considered to have started with Action Comics number one. The first appearance of Superman, the very first superhero. <clears throat> he was such an inspiring figure that was so popular amongst people that it and that he inspired dozens, hundreds of, of imitators and copycats. The term Golden Age was first used by Richard Lupoff in 1960 in a fan magazine, by the way. <clears throat> but what was the Silver Age, how long did the Golden Age last? Well, it's commonly believed that 1956's showcase number four, the first appearance of Barry Allen, is widely considered the first Golden Age, Silver Age book. Although some people make an argument for Detective 225, the first appearance of John Jones, the Manhunter from Mars. <clears throat> so if there is a Golden Age, and if there's a Silver Age, what happened in between? The anti-comics movement, a group of people loosely affiliated that thought comics may not have been such a great thing, started gaining traction first early in comic book history. Parents worrying about there being too much violence in the books or too much content. All the way back in 1943, it uh, spawned the first Child St Study Association of America's surveys of American comics. They performed surveys in 43 and 48 up to determine if comics were appropriate for a child audience. In both cases, it was determined that there was inappropriate material in comics, but as a whole, it wasn't, oh, they weren't overly problematic. In that same period of time, nearly half of all readers, that's from 45 and after, nearly half of all readers were 20 and over, many of them having been picking up comics in World War II and coming back with them. Nevertheless, by 1947, there was enough uh, pressure from parents and teachers groups, um, educators and that sort of thing, that Comic Pros decided to band together as the Association of Comic Magazine Publisher. And they started the first Comics Code. Uh, here, cover of, of Crypt of Terror 17 from EC Comics, proudly displaying the badge of the ACMP. And actually, they were one of the founding members, by the way. On July 1st, 1948, the ACMP formalized its code, and but it is known to prove an ineffective at regulating objectionable material in comics. One of the notable people that did not sign on, groups that did not sign on to the ACMP, were Dell Comics, who felt that their sterling good name as an all-ages uh, producer would just be there to distract from other people, other ne'er-do-wells in the business. Well, in 1953, um, the Senate to set up a subcommittee to investigate juvenile delinquency as part of the Judiciary, the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, and started holding hearings about why there were all these juvenile delinquents in America. Well, by 1954 in April, they got around to looking at comic books and they had a set of hearings um, to look into that question. And from that came this report, the Comic Books and Juvenile Delinquency Report. They relied heavily upon the, the expert witnesses like Dr. Fred, Drs. Frederick Worlam and Loretta Bender, 
the latter being a, a staff psychologist, psychiatrist for, uh, consulting psychiatrist for DC Comics, actually. And the head of DC Comics, William Gaines, uh, testified before the hearing. Now, Dr. Frederick Wortham is something of a boogeyman in comic fan circles and was one of the most outspoken opponents of the way comics were being dealt with in the 40s and 50s. He first spoke out in writing about um, comics in 1948, just before the founding of the ACMP code, but after the ACMP was, was agreed upon. <clears throat> he thought comics could cause crime, fascism, sexual deviancy, and violence that can inspire that in its readers because that's the nature of narrative storytelling. He was very nervous about mass marketing and its appeal to attract children as the audience. And he was a, but at the same time, he was a fierce defender of free speech and didn't think that the government should tell any business or company what they couldn't do in terms of producing product. He did, however, believe that children younger than 15 shouldn't be allowed to buy superhero comics, crime comics, horror comics. He actually didn't see any difference between uh, any uh, comics that glorified violence as a means to getting things done. So even Westerns were too violent for Dr. Wortham uh, in relation to dealing with children. <clears throat> in the aftermath of the Senate hearing, and the Senate came down and told the comic publishers that it was primarily their responsibility for telling uh, worthwhile stories to a youth audience. William Gaines had called together a bunch of old publishers to try to fund a study to show that the Senate was wrong and that Wortham was wrong and that comics didn't cause problems, um, that they were just art. Um, however, the other publishers didn't think that was a good idea and instead founded the Comics Magazine Association of America, which ended up forming uh, or empowering the Comics Code um, as a method of regulating things. Uh, among other things, the Comics Code was a strict guideline for things. They did not allow comic titles to have the word horror or crime or even weird in it. And they seemed direct stabs at the EC line of comics and also Lev Gleason's, the two companies that ended up going out of business. In fact, in 1955, EC Comics folded, unable to keep up with the market and only producing Mad Magazine uh, instead of their line of comics. In 1956, DC, Marvel, and Charlton all launched horror titles or expanded their line of horror titles, um, but rebranded them as mysteries, uh, such as Mystic World of Suspense, Tales of the Unexpected, and of course, House of Secrets. And on this slide, we see a picture of the first issue of House of Secrets um, with the uh, very ominous uh, horror type themes on there, a lot of thriller stuff. And emblazoned in the corner is of course the comics code seal. Now, the standard narrative for the, the, the upheaval at uh, the, in following the Senate hearings is that Wortham's claims in Seduction of the Innocent fueled the Senate hearings, um, that the Senate mandated the Comics Code Authority, and the Comics Code Authority ruined a thriving industry. Well, I've already demonstrated that Wortham's claims couldn't have, in Seduction, could not have claimed the Senate hearings, that there was unrest before Wortham came on the scene, and that the Senate hearing was called before Wortham's book was ever published in 54. It was published just before the Senate hearings. Now, the Senate didn't mandate the CCA. They simply said the publisher was responsible for what they did. And so anyway, they worked that out, it was on them. Um, and they chose the CCA, uh, once again, against um, <clears throat> Gaines' suggestion. The glass call that the CCA ruined a thriving industry is a question that I think we can look at some hard numbers on. Now, as I was told as a young child, superheroes started going by the wayside and a lot of people assumed comics did, but that's not really what happened. Uh, we're gonna look at a slide here in a second to show this off, but as superheroes diminished, comics actually increased. They broadened their market appeal. They got all kinds of Western romance, crime and horror books, even funny animal books exploded after 45 as superheroes got less and less important. In fact, there were just a handful of superheroes that continuously were published through that period of time. At about the same time, after 45 again, about half of the comic readers were over 20 and half of them were women. We have here a picture of young romance number one 
by Simon and Joe Simon and Jack Kirby there. Um, they did for, for prize comics. They weren't able to do that on the auspices of Marvel. They, Marvel didn't think they would sell. But they took this here and started a whole industry of romance comics. They were very, very popular. What we have here is a chart um, that I got from, from Gavillet's book of men in comics. A very, very interesting book. Um, and in it goes through a lot of the numbers and a lot of the preconceptions about these fan narratives that we've had about the history of comics. But we see that in 1952 was the peak of the comics industry. In that year, there was 3,161 3, individual titles sold that year with a circulation of about a billion getting out to people. The comics industry was moving millions and millions of books every week at that point. And actually I've been moving millions of books um, for quite a while. But we see as it goes up to 1952, it immediately starts sloping back down. Um, there was a huge high watermark and then, and then no more. Here we have a chart that actually is new research that has just been coming out last November, I mean, September, actually, I'm um, looking at distribution numbers, circulation numbers specifically, not just the number of titles in the market, but the actual number of titles that are going out there. And that blue line is Marvel, that uh, uh, purple line is National Comics or DC, yellow is Lev Gleason's Crime Comics, and then the green are these, the ever consistent Archie comics. And one of the things that we see is that uh, starting in 1952, there's, there is a, a peak up to that 1952 number. And then it's pretty much those circulation numbers dip down and relatively even out. I mean, it's not a straight line, but it's in a, in a given range of normalcy where um, from 1959 back to um, is the runs at the same level for about 20 years as we had at the 1946 levels. Um, that there's a, a peak in titles, that there is a peak in sales, and then it contracts in on itself to have a stabilizing effect. 1953 saw another important piece in this puzzle. Finally, a resolution of a long-standing court case between National Comics and Fawcett Comics over the nature of Captain Marvel. Uh, the power of Shazam character, right? And he um, was contested by DC to be a uh, copyright infringement. And the court actually finally agreed with him after so many years. And that Fawcett, uh, after losing in court and losing of a cash settlement, they decided to shutter their entire comic swing. There were several reasons for that. One is they had just recently invented the first run paperback novel called their gold medal novels that published crime novels like Mickey Splain and other kind of books direct to an adult clientele. And some of the, the, the business that they had had previously in comics was being served by this new paperback novel um, uh, business. <clears throat> and they didn't need that. They also closed the doors to their, their news, um, newsstand distribution. And who's there to pick up the pieces of both? Well, it's National Publications itself. National and its sister company, Independent News, um, which was a, a, uh, a distribution service, snatched up all the contracts and the contacts that Fawcett had left behind, replaced the Fawcett in the market, and even bought some of their characters outright. And this led to smaller companies like Marvel and Quality, until Quality went under later in the decade as well, at the mercies of their competitor, their main competitor, National and DC. Additionally, for people that didn't want to deal with independent, uh, the, the, the DC distribution, they could go through American News Company. But in 1952, before this was going down, right, 1952 came under, that company came under investigation by Congress under monopoly and antitrust laws. And eventually in 1957, um, they had to break up. They were found um, to have some guilt with that. They also lost three of their major contracts for Collier's, Dell Publishing, and Woman's Home Companion. And with that, they ended up shuttering their New York offices, narrowing the field for distribution at the end of the 50s even more. The final piece in the puzzle about what, why comics um, lost so much room over their historic highs 
1952, more than a third of American households had a TV, which was filled, which filled with virtually the same kinds of entertainment available in comic stores, and all for free, whether it was horror um, or thriller, like The Outer Limits or, uh, or Twilight Zone, those sort of things, or whether it was the romance shows or, or even uh, comedies like Dobie Gillis. They're there, they're free, and they're in people's homes. At this point, there just is no going back. So in conclusion, um, the question is, is who killed the, uh, the, the, the golden age? And I don't think that that's even a fair question in looking at all of the evidence going on. When one considers the public pressures, the shrinking market, an increase to distribution costs and a decrease in access to distribution venues, an increased competition from other media, especially after a well-documented boom and bust cycle, the observed trends in comics, uh, the observed trends of comics settling into stabilized, a stabilized pattern is not only a normal, but it's expected. The story of the golden age giving way to the silver age is not so much the story of success, of a new success riding out, rising out of a previous failure, but rather it is the story of order sublimating from chaos. In many ways, the question is not who killed the golden age, but rather, how did the golden age grow up? Thank you. I'll now present my uh, reference list. <laughs>